Bishop, thank you for allowing us to give this report. It's been an exciting nine months. That's how long that I've had my feet on the ground. Uh, but you know, all the work we do and have done would not be possible without a good team. And you, Bob is, is my right-hand person. I go to him, uh, I have been able to step away from a lot of things in order to focus on trying to get recovery going again in Lake Charles. But there are also other people. Uh, Jody, admin assistants, Julie and Tim, they're uh, both case managers. Um, Howard, who is the case manager supervisor. Uh, John is now providing project liaison work for us. Jasmine is our volunteer coordinator in Lake Charles. And then last but not least, my wife, Catherine. Thank you so much for your faithful service. I, I want to give you a brief history lesson. I think you see on the overhead. Some of you may not know of Last Island. Last Island was a vacation resort. Families from Louisiana would uh, take a train down to the coast, then board a steamship and go over to the island, partly to escape the yellow fever, uh, partly just to enjoy themselves. So on August 8th, 1856, the party uh, was gathered in a very large uh, resort hotel uh, on this island, which is about 25 miles long, and not knowing that the very next day, a tidal wave would wipe out the building and tear that island apart. The hotel took on water, the roof collapsed. Desperate survivors took refuge on a ship that had been grounded. Uh, those are basically the ones who survived. Almost 200 people lost their life during that hurricane. The hurricane became known as the worst hurricane for 164 years until 2020. This is the uh, National Weather Service radar in Lake Charles. It was built to withstand 140 mile an hour winds. You can see that there's an over-reporting from this station, and there is why. Laura ripped it apart. Laura also damaged 4,000 electrical transformers, 12,000 utility poles, commercial buildings, schools, churches. The hurricane destroyed 44,000 homes in Lake Charles. Damaged or destroyed. This building still stands in Lake Charles, the Capital One building. I don't think it will ever be recovered. Many of the evacuees had started to rebuild their homes, get the trees off, take some hope in the fact that things hopefully were going to change. And then something else happened. Can you imagine being in this destruction? This is what I saw my first day on the job here as I traveled to the bayou after Ida came through. And Lake Charles had already experienced that. And we are about 18 months or so afterwards, and we are still seeing this in Lake Charles and Southwest Louisiana. My first experience Lake Charles, I felt a sense of desperation and hopelessness. And then Hurricane Delta came. I-10 is packed with cars trying to escape, leaving behind the houses they had started to work on. This hurricane came in only 12 miles from where Laura had come in. 
Laura was a windstorm, Delta was a rain event. It dropped 12 inches of rain on an already fragile infrastructure, causing widespread flooding. Many of the repairs that had been done for Laura were undone. We just cannot overstate not only the physical damage, but the mental damage caused by the second hurricane. And that all came, and what came later was this, an ice storm in February. It took out uh, much of the water supply by breaking pipes. The temperature dropped to 14 degrees. It was a 30-year low. So now we're counting number three. And then came the flood. Many of the houses that had been worked on, people had just started to move back in. There were boxes on the floors. Their goods were ruined one more time. The repair work had to be redone. And then what else did we have to deal with? The pandemic. Stay at home, can't go to school, can't go to work. Can you go home? Do you have a home? The answer in many cases were no, they did not. Avoid contact with others. So not only do you feel desperate, hopeless, now you've lost your uh, social peace that gives you the encouragement. If Lake Charles were a person, it would be called Job. <laughs> now we missed one of the disasters, and that was a hurricane that popped through. So they had five in about 18 months. And then let's stop that off with Hurricane Ida. It hit the Gulf Coast. You can see Grand Isle here before and after. It destroyed it. The damage was about $55 billion. It left thousands of people homeless. To give you some idea of how powerful it was, 35 tornadoes were spun off. This is one that went through New Jersey. And for 164 years, Last island hurricane was the strongest in Louisiana history until Laura in 2020. Laura's record stood for one year until Ida struck. So how do we respond? What do we do? And as you know, Methodists have a long history of hands and feet on the ground and working for Christ. And I don't think anyone could speak to this topic better than my co colleague, Bob Dyke. Thank you, Bill. It's been quite a journey. Tried to retire last July 1, and Bishop Harvey had recorded a video and said, I don't think you're gonna do retirement very well. And I just, I. Blame it on you, Bishop. <laughs> Ida was, uh, what's the B word? Um, bad. <laughs> By all accounts, but let's put it in perspective, Hurricane Katrina, which got a lot of national publicity, and rightly so, 25,000 homes in Orleans Parish flooded. Hurricane Ida, 380,000 homes were impacted, including 90,000 that lost their homes at least partially, or lost their roofs partially or at what FEMA calls a catastrophic level. A lot of our friends and neighbors were in the path. In that immediate aftermath, everyone wants to do something. We all want to respond. This storm that went from Grand Isle, basically right up the I-55 corridor. 
our friends, our neighbors were in that path. Now, Laura impacted more households because it hit a metropolitan area. But let me give a snippet of, and we're gonna hear something about environmental impact or stewardship, I think. We lost 140 square miles of Louisiana to Hurricane Ida. Marshland, barrier islands, wetlands that aren't there anymore and they're not coming back, which means the next storm will not have those out there to slow it down, to stop the tidal surge, to break the waves, and there will be another storm. 140 square miles, take Baton Rouge to New Orleans and go two miles wide, one mile either side of Interstate 10 and just erase it from the map. So we need to move on. The stages of what we do include readiness, early response, recovery, which is a great deal of what Bill's been leading over in southwest Louisiana and that we're getting a toehold on in the Ida zone. Readiness, early response, recovery, and review, where we're supposed to be able to take a breath and what did we do well and what needs to be done better. Very quickly, I was in a Zoom call with our my compatriots and, and from around the connection, moderated by uh, Laura Martin from UMCOR. There are about 50 or so disaster response leaders from all the conferences represented in the US. And she said, right now, this is a couple of months ago, she said, right now is what we call the blue sky time where you could be doing your review work and readiness for the next event, whatever that might be. And then she paused and she said, unless you're from Louisiana and you haven't had a blue sky time in seven years. There's a difference between response and recovery. What's the difference and why is it important? ERT's early response team members are people just like you and me. Different ages, various skill sets, different walks of life, but all with a passion to serve. You don't need any special background or expertise. You don't have to be able to run a skid steer or a chainsaw or a tractor. We all receive some basic what we call best practice training. We share a heart and a desire to carry out what our motto is, is providing a caring Christian presence in the aftermath of disaster. What that means is that we come alongside people and the most important thing that we can do is to listen. To pause and to walk alongside someone, to put an arm around them, to let them know that they are not alone, that there is hope. Even when we feel that God is very distant, we can come alongside and we can have others come alongside. Perhaps share a, a prayer with that person. But to let them know that they are a loved child of God. And as ERT members, as early response team members, we minister to those in need, whoever they are, because disaster doesn't give a rip where your political stands are or your political boundaries or the color of your skin. As we say, the ground is all level at the foot of the cross. We're proud to represent you. We go where we're needed when we're called by invitation. Last December, the storms that raked across the middle of the country tore up Kentucky and Tennessee and we were one of two of the first ERT teams. I think you can be proud of that. We were called to go to Kentucky. We represent you and we go 
at the invitation of those conferences, I just received a call or a text this morning from the coordinator in Kentucky giving an update, asking if there's somebody down here that we, they can come and help. That's what we're called to do, to come alongside one another. With that, I'll turn it back over to Bill. Thank you, Bob. I really do appreciate Bob's ministry, his leadership, and especially his friendship. Um, very few of you know who I am. You've seen the uh, announcement of my hiring by the bishop. Uh, a friend of mine reminded me that it might be good if people truly understood who I was. Uh, I was the eldest of four sons. I was born to teenage parents. Uh, my father could not read or write, and my mother was the only high school diploma in our history. At age 16, I went for a job interview, and I was told, son, I can't hire you. I can't understand a word you are saying. And yet, the pharmacy manager hired me, and over the next few years, she taught me where to put my tongue, how to say things like SHs and CRs and some of the basics. And another woman came alongside of her to help. Uh, the pharmacy manager became my mother-in-law and the other woman became my wife. <laughs> I don't know if that was payback or, or what that was. I do believe that God has a plan for each of us. I surely did not have coming to Baton Rouge and diving into this as part of my uh, career goal or my bucket list. But yet, here we are. There's a picture here. Catherine and I had the opportunity to go and uh, be with uh, Governor Reynolds during the inauguration uh, event. You know, I, I think that's a pretty fine-looking lady. And he, even the guy cleans up fairly well. We were on our way to Houston to set up a mission trip for a team that Catherine and I have been doing mission trips with for several years now. They're in Iowa. Uh, I guess I could say I made the mistake of stopping in Sulphur and talking with the Fuller's group about that mission trip because I met Elaine and I later, later, later met Van and they got my resume through the system and the next thing I know I'm talking to the bishop about coming to Baton Rouge. Now Catherine and I were sort of struggling with that decision because uh, I had retired for the third time. I was pretty comfortable. My grandson lived across the fence from me and every evening, he would come and cuddle up underneath my elbow. And then we went to church one Sunday, and God whispered in my ear. And the message went uh, something like, as soon as I, <laughs> sorry, I've lost my uh, spot. It went something like this. If you can't serve me here, I can't use you anywhere. But if you can serve me here, I can use you anywhere. And I really felt like the Lord was talking to me one more time. And so Catherine and I made a decision to pack her stuff up and to come to Baton Rouge. Now, one of the things you may have heard the bishop say is she wondered if there would be a second day. What I didn't tell her was I wondered if there was going to be an end to the first day. We saw so much disaster that day. We traveled down the uh, corridor that I had come into. Uh, I met Bob for the first time. I never met Bob before. Uh, we were trying to figure out how to deploy ERT uh, down the Ida corridor. I did not know Louisiana. I had no idea how to say Ponchatoula. It only took me about two weeks to get that one put down. So I asked for a map, we laid a map out on the table, we talked about what was the best strategy, where were ERTs coming from, and then Bob took over. And then I stepped back 
and I began to answer Bishop Harvey's request to bring hope back to Lake Charles. On October 8th, I met for lunch with Phil Helmuth. Phil is the coordinator, project coordinator for the Mennonites in Jennings. They had been there operating and doing repair work on homes that had been damaged or destroyed. Uh, after a few minutes, we understood what each other's strengths were. The Mennonites bring labor. They bring the Amish to the table. The conference brings case management, leadership, and funding. And so one of the questions I asked Phil before we left, I said, Phil, can we get the Amish to Lake Charles in January? And he started laughing at me, and he said, we just talked last week with the national leadership. There will be no more deployments until fall of 2022. Less than a week later, Phil called me and said, Texas is not ready, Tennessee is finished. Would it be possible to bring the Amish to Lake Charles in January? I believe that was a God thing. About 11 days later, we knew we had one leg missing, and that was a construction management and materials uh, piece. Uh, having met with the Fuller's group trying to set up this uh, mission trip, I felt like they were the right people to bring to the table. So we decided to have a Zoom call, talk about whether or not we could form a coalition. And before the Zoom call was over, we had a, for a coalition formed. Our goal was to repair 25 to 30 homes. And since we had begun the process, the only thing that we needed to do was to get busy. It was an amazing event. Uh, you can see here what each person brings to the table. And let me tell you, the coalition was a catalyst to get this work started. The United Methodist Foundation put the money up to start the first roofs in Lake Charles. Had it not been for those two pieces, I do not believe we would have been successful in Lake Charles. The Mennonites and Fullers both bring different things, like I've said. I don't know if you know, but the Mennonites, the MDS, uh, supplies everything that the Amish need, right down to the spoons they eat with. So we had about a quarter mile caravan coming into Lake Charles uh, the week before the volunteers arrived with cook trailers, uh, shower trailers, RVs, tool trailers, uh, containers, you name it, they brought it. The real question was, where, did the, where would the Amish stay? Now, you got to understand, the Amish do not want us to pollute their youth. And so they're very picky about where they bring their volunteers. How would they get back and forth to the job sites? Well, those questions were answered when their leadership hit the ground. Here's a picture of Reverend Angela Buloff. They provided, her and her church provided the volunteer housing for the Amish. It was an amazing event. Here's your Amish uh, young men coming down from where they were sleeping. They slept up on the uh, second floor of University Church's uh, used to be Sunday school training rooms. This was a pavilion, an open air pavilion that was at University. The Amish came in and within a week they had put walls up, windows in, doors in, connected our kitchen. This is inside. This is where they ate, met, and worshipped. Elmer. Elmer was one of the volunteer drivers. Uh, it was so neat, the churches came together in Lake Charles because the Amish don't drive other than a buggy. And so we needed to figure out how to get these vehicles with the Amish to where they were going to do their work. And so the churches stepped up and they provided drivers. 
And what was the overall effect? We saw hope coming back into the community of Lake Charles in southwest Louisiana. You can see the Amish here working. The ladies, it's just amazing. They're in their long skirts or dresses, their bonnets. Uh, this particular community uh, did not allow uh, any type print on their dresses, but they could have different colors. They also could wear their uh, sleeves up just above their wrist, and they could wear their dresses and skirt just above their ankles. Each community is different. What really started to happen was we started to get TV coverage. Channel 7 came out, videoed the ladies up on the roof laying shingles. Uh, social media, Lake Charles American Press, The Advocate, and it goes on and on. We've had Fox News then to do national report on the Amish. And then we had, once you saw that happening, we had more nonprofits coming to us saying, we have money, we have materials, we don't have labor. Could we use some of the Amish to do some of the work? And the answer was yes. And so we were able to join hands with, let me, let me back up. We started in Lake Charles with three nonprofits, Fuller's MDS Conference. Ten and a half weeks later, we had 12 nonprofits uh, working together to affect the change in Lake Charles over to Jennings. Remember our goal, 25 to 30 homes? Sixty-six homes rebuilt. <laughs> 24,000 volunteer hours. $600,000 in materials purchased, value of $1.2 million into the Southwest Louisiana. I am very grateful for the United Methodist Conference and the leadership that they bring. We could not do this alone and there's a tremendous amount of strength in partnering together so I'm grateful for the United Methodist Conference and I'm grateful for the Fuller Center for their involvement and their expertise and all of us build on our strengths. Our strength is volunteers. This is a new model for how we do disaster going forward in Louisiana. Our hope is we just begin to scratch the surface. I think there are so many other opportunities and possibilities. We'll take what we learn here on Southwest. At the end of the day, I believe we're gonna have a Louisiana disaster response that can be modeled anywhere in the country you want to go. There is something about bringing together persons who respond to the needs of individuals where we're looking beyond ourselves. Oftentimes when we look inward and we, we focus just upon ourselves, we end up being divisive. But when we focus on the needs of others around us, it brings people together. It has been nonstop. And it has been an amazing journey with many, many challenges. In the beginning, I didn't have a clue. The best I could do is get in a vehicle, try and figure out how to say some of the names of the communities that I was going to. Today, I know those communities. I know them not only by name, but by being there and being with the folks in the community. I just don't know what the next challenge is, but it's as if God's plan is unfolding as we journey. And so parts and pieces we never even thought could take place have come together. And if you have any doubt about that, look behind me and see what these folks are doing. I often refer to it as, it's almost like heaven <laughs> because of the fact that our differences don't matter when we are focused on the needs of others and able to respond. I've been doing this for a long time. This is the first. This morning I met some young ladies, Amish, 
who live in the Finger Lakes region of New York. And a gentleman here who's on a VIM team that's out of Iowa, but he lives in Escambia County, Florida, where we were after Hurricane Michael. Where else could people come together and for what other purpose? Amish, Mennonites, Methodists, these backgrounds. And here we have young ladies and young men that come all the way across the country by bus because they don't own vehicles. And they come here to Southwest Louisiana and give her their time climbing on a roof on a beautiful day. You can't find this, you can't make it up. We have very much the same mission, the different organizations. And I thought yesterday, all the folks coming together, you know, this is an army of people coming together to do good. And that's somewhat different than armies we think about. And so it's just a great feeling to see these folks all working together. To help people get back into their homes. That's what we really want. And just get hope back into the community. We just want to express our love for them, show them that we care because Jesus loves us. We want to pass it on to them so they can feel the love that we get from Jesus. Help from your heart, you know, is, is what you're doing. So if you're really, truly loving your neighbor, you try to help them. God gives everybody different talents. So some people are talented to help with money. Others are talented to give with food. Others are talented to give with whatever. But I feel that my calling is to help out on job sites. So. We love because God first loved us. And the scripture tells us that. We didn't gin it up inside ourselves. We didn't come up with it. It's not my idea or your idea or anyone's idea. It didn't come from the top down. It didn't come except for God welling up inside of us and touching us directly and showing us his love in Christ that we could go out love. So we love because he first loved us. That worked. And I will tell you, these folks came to our community as strangers. They worked as friends and they went home as family. What are we gonna do with what we learned? And we're gonna apply it across Louisiana and we're gonna apply it over in the Ida area. And we're already there. Uh, you may not know, but we have deployed volunteers in the Hammond They've been working on homes for quite some time now. Uh, we are currently in the process of working with the Catholic Diocese down uh, in Grand Isle, all the way across to uh, Dulac. We have a team of uh, volunteers in building bunk beds at the Grand Isle Catholic Volunteer Facility. They plan to have 70 volunteers in the Grand Isle in the next two to three weeks. Uh, Bob, I, and Catherine went down to visit, and this happened because we wanted Southeast to have some of the same benefits that we got in the Southwest. And so I spoke with MDS, the Mennonites, and I said, what can we do to have the same model working in Southeast? They gave me a couple of names, phone numbers, I made some cold calls, and within 24 hours, I started to get calls back. And the priest and Grand Isle said, get in the car and come down, we need to talk. So we went down, Bob, I, and Catherine, we spent a half a day with them. We asked what their mission was, what their needs were. And we had the Bayou Community Foundation chairman of the board and executive director, and they said, we need volunteers. And we said, okay. The priest said, we can put in RV hookups. And we said, okay. Before the day was over, we had nomads being diverted to Grand Isle in October. And they'll be there October, December, and we're requesting more coming in 2023. We toured the volunteer housing. They had one bunk bed, expecting 70 volunteers to come in. Within the next day, we had identified volunteers to go in and build bunk beds. They didn't have shower facilities. We now have a shower house or shower trailer setting at Grand Isle. And it was funny because the executive director of the foundation said, could you guys write down what you can bring to the table? And before she could even think about writing it down, we were bringing things to the table. 
we plan to work about 90 homes on repairs on about 10 new bills in the southeast area. But what's going to happen to, to southwest Louisiana? Well, Catherine and I got a note from the Amish. They said, would you guys please come up and attend our annual meeting? And this is about a month ago. So we did. Now, the funny part is Catherine sort of says what's on her mind. So she asked, she said, why would you guys have heathens come to your meeting? And uh, their response was pretty straightforward. We don't think that way. We are all Christians. And you know what? Heaven's not going to be divided by denomination. And so we went, and I spoke to them, sort of like I'm speaking to you. And afterwards, they asked me to go to their board meeting. And in that board meeting, they were deciding whether or not to come back to Lake Charles. Their answer is yes. They are coming back. They're sending their leadership team here August 8th, 9th, and 10th but I did not walk away unscathed. I was to have 10 homes ready for them August 8th so they could walk and sign job cards. And when they sign a job card, that means they're gonna work on the house. Well, the last time they asked for 10, I came up with four and a half. Today, we have 12 homes ready for August uh, 8th meeting. We have five homes that need to be rebuilt. So Phil and I talked about with them about what their goals were for Southwest Louisiana. They want to build 30 new homes. They want to repair 70 to 80 homes between November and March, the end of March. They're going to be here five months. Now, the only issue is that $5 million that it takes to do that work. And so Phil's task and my task was to come back to Louisiana and figure out how to raise $5 million. I will tell you we're probably at about two to two and a half million at this point. My belief is that if God opens the door, God will provide. And so we're going to move forward. Meanwhile, we still have great needs throughout Louisiana. We've already talked about moving into uh, hurricane seasons. And it's predicted the season we're in right now is going to be one of the busiest. I'm praying we will get at least one year of blue sky. But we don't know where the next storm is coming, winter will come. And so I want Bob to come and talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing around readiness. Thank you, Bill. Very quickly, in your little bling bag or goodie bag, there was a card. There's a QR code on there. You can scan it with your smartphone and it will take you to a four question survey and we will get you engaged and involved in the readiness work and the response work and the recovery work. So take that card. We're here to facilitate your ministry. I wanna close with a story about a young woman that I met in um, in Iowa, and uh, that's Mr. Patrick Mouton there in the video. Uh, the scripture says that uh, eye has not seen, ear has not heard. Well, I went there to, uh, to check on a team and to thank the Amish for coming and, uh, and met him and prayed with him and encouraged him. And his daughter said he went from a place of no hope and she said, hope has now come home. Now I'll tell you the story about Sandy Kriegel there in that, in that last picture. Very quickly, we took a team by invitation. We were in central Iowa in a little small uh, farming town called Grinnell after what's called a derecho went through there. 120, 130 mile an hour winds just flattened uh, the entire corn crop from border to border and uh, covered about four states. We met Sandy. The week that Laura was coming in, we left on a Sunday morning and there wasn't even a cloud in, in the sky. Tuesday night, Elaine Burley called and said, when are you coming home? And I said, well, we were planning on driving back on Saturday and she said, there's a storm in the Gulf. Our host church in that little Iowa town, a thousand miles from home, 
set up a video monitor for us to watch the weather channel that night and we see Laura and in 48 hours Laura went from being a declared hurricane to being a cat four storm which made landfall on Thursday. I met with the team, the four of us, two of us from Ruston, two from Clinton, and uh, said, you know, we can bug out any time. We've got a two-day drive to get home. It's a thousand miles. What do you want to do? They said, let's work one more day. As it was, we drove home through Arkansas, driving into the outer bands of Laura as we were headed home. It was a thrilling ride. But that last day, we drove up to our very last home and take in mind that we said we were ready to, to bug out and get back to our families. But that very last day, we drove up to a home, huge pine trees down in the yard, and I knocked on the door, and this diminutive lady came, stood out on the, stepped out on the porch, barely a hair on her head. And as a cancer survivor, I just asked, what kind was it? Breast cancer. And the day that that storm hit her little town, she was on her way home from her last treatment. And she said, I didn't know if anyone would ever come. Thank you for coming. And it was, I guess, important that we cleaned up her property and took all those trees out. But the most important thing was when we circled around her and we laid one hand on her, and we laid one hand on the team member next to us as we prayed over her. We've stayed in touch. Every time we deploy, she posts something on our little page, and I told her I was going to share some of her story, and I'll just close with these words because I wanted her permission to share her story with you. And... She said, I'm honored to have you share my story. Things are going good here. I bought a new house, and I close on it next Wednesday. I'm a little nervous because I'm needing to have another surgery in August. I only have two or three days of paid time off, and I will have to return to work as soon as I can. I know that God will take care of my money and my recovery. Please request prayers for me when you tell my story. I, I am so blessed to wake up every day and live my best life for the glory and grace of God. I will pray that you and your teams will stay safe during your travels and while you are helping others. And I just wondered if there's anyone else who will remember to pray for Sandy? Would you raise your hand? You're going to have unprecedented opportunities to be in ministry to the Sandys and the Patrick Moutons of the world. Doors will open. Our job is to help you walk through them, that we walk through them together. Thank you, Bob. In conclusion, I want to uh, underscore that none of this could be done without the support from local churches. 
Will you join me in acknowledging the hard work of local churches, some of whom have sacrificed so much over the past few years? Yes, sir, at microphone number five. Bishop, I don't know if this is the correct time to do this, but uh, may I offer a, a point of, of suggestion or recommendation or testimony at this point for what's going on with, uh, on behalf of Bob and, and Bill and all of the, uh, the folks that represent the early response team? Can I, can I offer? Yes, sir, you may. My name is Terry Lindsay. Uh, I'm a local pastor until, Jan until June 30th of Vassar United Methodist Church. I've been a pastor for 24 years. I've been to, I think, probably 24 of these annual conferences. And on all 24 of these conferences have, have offered a lot of challenges and a lot of, a lot of very, very spirit felt. Uh, and I will miss, if my church does go, I will probably go with them. But having said that, six years ago, about six years ago, Bob could correct me. I got involved with Lake Charles uh, when they had the no storm. Maybe, maybe some, many of you might remember the no storm, a lot of flooding. We spent uh, weeks uh, in, in looking at how we could help people. Bob is such a giver, and I learned so much from him that it's not about going and, and mucking out a house. It's about going and loving on people. And, and we did a lot of loving on people that day. And that, that opened up my, my heart and my mind. And God is asking me and, and is telling me you need to get up on this mic and say this. Uh, to me, that is where, where it, the rubber meets the road when it comes to, to, ch and to being a Christ Spirit-filled church. That is the church, not the building, not the building. The, the church was those days when we're out there ministering, and, you know, we're all inclusive, everyone. We're not looking at any, 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 anything, but what can we do to help you? If it means a prayer, if it means uh, just picking up and spending, uh, spending days and hours talking to someone. And, and I've had lots of con contact, a lot of, uh, lot of contact with people. But I just want to, I don't know if you guys realize the, the tremendous heart that, that Bob has and the heart that, that Bill has and all of those that have gone on uh, through the uh, We've been up in Kentucky. Uh, if you know me, I've got an old truck, and I've got five chainsaws in the back of this truck all the time. And I'm, I go wherever mm -hmm. I'm going. I'm either in Dulac or Galliano or up in Kentucky or Lake Charles. After Hurricane Ida, I had just come back from visiting my, my uh, wife's mother in England. Just got back two weeks before Hurricane Ida hit, and we were deployed wherever we needed. I think I was in Ponchatoula when B Bill mentioned. Yes, sir. The, my point is, and I'll shut up because I could be here for all, all day. My point is, I don't know how many ERT people are in the room, but I, I'm not going to embarrass anyone to, to ask you to raise your hand, but I can tell you there's probably not enough. We all need to be part of it. You don't have to run a chainsaw or skid steer, as Bob <coughs> pointed out, though I like doing that. But I, and, and I've traveled and pulled trailers up and down uh, I-10 and I-49 corridor many times. You, don't, you can do that. Whatever God leads you to do, to me, this is the most important, my feeling, most important hands and feet of Christ that we could possibly be uh, in the ERT in, in our mission work. It is well and truly a, a mission uh, blessed by God. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your ministry in this and your continued ministry, wherever it might lead you. You will be blessed and a blessing to others.